Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this Global Investigative Journalism Network webinar, which is about making an impact, measuring and increasing the effects of investigative journalism. My name is Anya Schifrin, and I'm the Director of the Technology Media Communications Specialization at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. And we have an illustrious panelist with us today who will be talking about the topic at hand. I think everyone can introduce themselves before they, they speak their piece. Um, but we have Grace Murray, Wahyu Dejatomika, and Lindsay Green Barber on the Zoom with us. And all of them have been studying this question in great detail in different parts of the world. As we all know, watchdog reporting makes a critical contribution to society by exposing wrongdoing, fighting corruption, and promoting accountability. But how do we measure this? And how do we explain to a skeptical public the value of investigative reporting? At a time of unprecedented attacks on the press, a broken financial model, and low public trust, it's critical to understand what impact means, why it matters, and how journalists can increase it. The in-depth the impact of in-depth systematic reporting is not always obvious, yet study after study point to a correct correlation between a free active media and democracy. What about the impact of one media outlet or even a single story? Impact can be visible and obvious, such as when a government official resigns or a company's stock price collapses. It can be measured in metrics like dollars saved, assets frozen or seized, or policy reforms passed. Journalists working in countries with authoritarian governments and journalists in exile face special difficulties, yet many have found ways to make an impact. What can we learn from them? I'd like to introduce today's speakers. I'll keep my introductions short, and here goes. Many of them need no introduction. And of course, we have an incredible audience as well with lots of old friends. Grace Murray is Acting Impact Editor and Environment Impact Producer at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, working to ensure that investigations have tangible impact beyond publication. Grace has more than 10 years of experience in environmental politics, policy, and television production. Wahyu Diatomika is CEO of InfoMedia Digital, the digital arm of Tempo Media Group, which is a well-respected and leading source of independent journalism in Indonesia. Wahyu helped lead Tempo's transformation into a digital newsroom. He also founded checkfactcut.com, which is Indonesia's first fact-checking collaboration program platform, and indonesialeaks.id, the country's only whistleblower secure platform. Lindsay Green Barber is the principal and founder of Impact Architects. She's known around the world for her expertise in media impact strategy and measurement. She's worked with media organizations, nonprofits, and funders to develop customized impact frameworks, design strategies for maximizing impact, and conduct research to assess success. Before we start, I just want to provide you a little bit of information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations, 250, 244 member organizations in 90 countries. But it works with journalists everywhere, nonprofits, commercial organizations, and with freelancers. It has an extensive range of resources and tip sheets to help journalists worldwide, which you can find on GIJN.org. It's also got a wonderful annual conference, which will be happening this year in September, and I'll certainly be going to that. We also want to make sure we hear from you. So please send written questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. And you can just start asking questions from now if you like. When the speakers are finished, GIJN's Emily O'Sullivan will join us on screen to moderate the questions, and we'll be recording this and posting it later on YouTube. So now I think it's time to start. I think that we'll have discussion and questions for about 75 minutes, and then we'll start taking audience questions um, as well, just before the top of the hour with Emily moderating the questions. We'll have a hard stop in a little over an hour from now. And please be sure to watch our Twitter feed and website for details on future, future events. I think that we're beginning with Grace, and I know that many of the presenters have slides that they're going to be showing you. So perhaps Grace would like to uh, open up. Brilliant. Thank you for that introduction, Anya. And I'm really happy to be here today. So I'm just going to 
launch my slides there. Can I just get a thumbs up that um, we can see them? Great, thank you. Um, so as Anya said, I'm um, an impact producer at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is a non-profit journalistic organization based in the UK. And we do uh, investigations global and local in the UK um, into areas of public interest. And we also work in a partnership model where we co-publish with different outlets um, across the world. So please bear that in mind and um, please do get in touch um, in the future as well. And as um, Anya said, I've been acting impact editor for most of 2022 when our impact editor, Miriam Wells, was on maternity leave, who many of you may know um, already. So I wanted to start, you know, the first question I get, what is impact? And we have gone through a little bit, you know, that it can be all kinds of changes as a result of your story. And the role of journalism in society is very much at the center of this. So at the Bureau, we think of impact as basically anything that happens off the page or beyond publication. So any result from your story, any action, any community organization, from the kind of micro level right up to the macro institutional changes. And I know um, that Lindsay will be talking about the kind of different measurements later. So we actually have sparking change as part of our logo. And this word sparking is really crucial because we are journalists, we are exposing wrongdoing, and we are holding um, people accountable for this wrongdoing. But we are not um, the people bringing about the change ourselves. We are not um, campaigners or activists, um, but we just want to provide that kind of um, the evidence basically that other people can go away um, and use. So I wanted to give you some examples of what um, impact we have measured um, in the last year or so. I mean, we've had this role of impact editor at the Bureau for almost four years now, and we have impact producers in several of our global teams and we have uh, community organizers in our um, UK team as well. So we very much have um, impact embedded throughout the Bureau. Um, but I'm aware that a lot of people um, here today will not have that kind of structure. So I wanna talk through some examples um, of impact that we've had recently and um, how that could be possible to uh, replicate. Um, so this is an example from an investigation that we had out a couple of weeks ago, connecting collagen supplements um, that many people are adding um, to their drinks, um, and it has high uh, celebrity endorsement. Um, we, uh, we connected collagen supplements in the collagen industry to deforestation uh, in Brazil and the devastation of indigenous people's lands in Brazil. Um, and when we uh, sent our right to replies to the different companies, um, we got back uh, our responses ahead of publication. And we were able to see um, a kind of memo from one of the companies at the heart of our um, investigation, Vital Proteins, who instructed their suppliers that they were ending sourcing from the Amazon region effective immediately. So this is quite a kind of traditional example of a company changing their practices as a result um, of an investigation, or I should say pledging to change uh, their actions as a result of our investigation. And then this is another example um, of an investigation that we worked on for over a year, um, for almost all of 2022, around how Qatar uh, hacked the World Cup and the vast um, series of, of, of networks um, of hacking involved. Um, and as a result of this story, um, right at the end of last year, um, the French uh, police decided to launch their own investigation um, off the back of our investigation um, in order to pursue, um, pursue this further. 
Um, so those are quite kind of traditional examples, I think, that, you know, a big government investigation, they are a company changing their business practices. Um, but this is one of my favorite examples. Um, this is Peter. And Peter, we met um, a year ago as part of an investigation into um, home adaptations, which is basically in the UK, there is funding for people with disabilities to adapt their homes to make them livable. Um, and when we first met Peter, this is the photo that you see on the left. Peter um, has a prosthetic leg and he would have to take off his leg in order to use his kitchen, in order to use his oven. Um, he would have to wheel himself into the kitchen, taking off his leg. And in order to put um, pies, you know, things into his oven, he would have to crawl on the floor. This is obviously not a way to live. Um, and as part of our investigation, we were count, uh, contacting all the different councils um, in order to find out the different wait times, the funding and so on. And the fact that our journalists did that meant that one of the Peter's council fast tracked his, his, um, his process, basically. Um, and he got a new kitchen. And this is something that I had mentioned as one of my favorite examples before. But at, at the end of last year, we went and visited Peter again. And you can see the picture on his right. On the right, he's standing. He can use his new oven. Um, and that's one person. That's one life. Um, but we can see there that the reporting really did make a difference. And, and we actually published a follow up piece um, talking to his daughter and talking to other people in that investigation to find out whether it did really make a difference for them to be part of the reporting. So that individual um, community level is is really crucial. So. I kind of want to get a sense of whether people already are thinking about impact. I mean, I think you are if you've um, joined today. Um, and I think it's one of the most crucial things is at what stage of your investigations and your reporting are you thinking about impact? Um, at the Bureau, you know, we have this model with an impact editor and impact producers. And so it's very much embedded. But what we're seeing now is more and more that our reporters themselves, because we have this model and because this is what we are, um, this is this is how we work, our reporters are already kind of thinking impact minded kind of as as they go. Um, so the scoping stage is really, really crucial. Um, because everyone has limited time, limited resources, and it's really important when you're at those early stages to be thinking why, why we're doing this story, what difference could this story make, where are the pressure points, what are the systemic issues that our story could expose um, in, in a new way. And so to have that kind of, um, have that just questioning at the beginning, is really important. We call it the so what of the story. And it's often um, being an impact producer is sometimes being that annoying person in a meeting being like, well, why are we doing this? It, it sounds kind of cool, but is it actually, you know, is it gonna do anything? Hasn't that been really overreported? You know, those kind of being the annoying person. Um, and I think really, if you're thinking about impact as well, you it's it's worthwhile to think about what kind of impact you want to focus on. Um, the high level stuff is great. The, you know, the resignations, the assets seized, that's all really important. But we have a very kind of broad church thinking at the Bureau when it comes to impact. And it's really about how we do our journalism, who we're involving at the early stages of our journalism, working in a collaborative uh, way and this is all impact for us and somebody coming back to us who was involved in our story um who says you know this was a real morale booster for the community or this was a morale booster for our cause we track we count that as impact we track it and we celebrate it so i think that's um that's crucial to be thinking about because sometimes people can just be thinking about it as a government change as a resignation.
So I'll just run through, I mean, I've already talked briefly about the structure at the Bureau and being the annoying so what person at the beginning of the meetings. Um, but we do, we have a couple of tools that we use um, to really embed impact. And one of these is at the initial reporting stages, if we're moving on to a topic that's quite uh, new for our reporters, we often do a systems mapping uh, exercise where we will bring together directly affected communities, academics, experts, and maybe an NGO or a charity involved in the issue to really understand the kind of the story around the story, um, to really understand what the historic and systemic issues have been around this um, and to really ask who holds the power, who has who has the power to change things, who wins in this situation, who who loses out in this situation. These are all these are all questions that I'm sure you ask yourself already in um in in an in the course of an investigation. But this is, you know, we think this is really crucial um, when thinking about impact. We also want to uh, define who the different audiences are. Um, we have a strand working on the financing of fossil fuels, and we are really keen to get those kind of stories in front of bank employees at all kinds of levels. So that for us in that strand would be quite a crucial impact audience. Um, because obviously the banks themselves are the people with the power to change and change within an organization can come from multiple levels. We're not just talking kind of C-suite. Um, setting the key messages is really crucial. I think this is, you know, not just an impact point, but what kind of three things do you want people to come away from your story realizing? I think everyone, you know, is so passionate about the work that they do. Um, and we're all, you know, very detailed people as well. But what what are those kind of key messages that you want people to come away um, from your story reading and in order to really kind of deliver what you see as potential impact of the story? Um, we try to evaluate our stories as they're going along um, and we'll set an impact strategy that I'll just show you a kind of template for on the next slide, which is here. This was a kind of template that I used for the environment team around our deforestation um, investigations. And along the kind of top row, you can see the sort of different um, impact agents. So kind of public pressure groups, campaigners, NGOs, civil society, then like investors and shareholders in companies, politicians and legislators, um, the supermarkets and uh, retailers uh, and brands themselves. And we've, we're also interested in whether, you know, lawyers would use our work for strategic litigation as well. So that's kind of in that column. And then you can kind of fill these sort of things in with who you're talking to, um, what material you would produce to reach these people. So, you know, when it comes to politicians, um, they might just want a one page briefing that they could easily turn into a speech. They don't want um, 10 pages. But if you are talking to maybe like a government uh, agency or a kind of um, more of a civil servant, they might want all the documents um, and a kind of chunky 20 page um, briefing. So just thinking about how you're tailoring your story to different people in order to create um, impact is, is a crucial one. Um, I can run through, we have a sort of ABC um, of impact, which is um, getting the actual evidence to the right people in the right format, which I've touched on. Um, it's the big, conversation um, and going back to the collagen investigation that I talked about we really wanted as a sort of impact goal for this to put collagen on the map when people are talking about commodities linked to deforestation like gold timber uh, beef soy and so on and so we you know we've seen um, an editorial from um, Boston Globe I think which um you know, does mention collagen alongside those other commodities. And so just kind of putting something on the map, it's hard to measure, um, but that is a kind of example there. Um, the collaboration with change drivers, 
drum banging over a long period. This is very crucial, I think, because you can really work on stories for years um, and impact doesn't happen at the art to art stage. Sometimes, sometimes it happens months or years after a story is published. Um, engaging with affected communities and bringing stories that generate kind of real feelings in your audience is, I think, crucial for bringing about impact. So I'm going to stop uh, there. I wanted to just give a couple of tips and tricks um, for uh, if you're doing impact with sort of zero people to work on it, zero budget. The three things I would say to do is to Number one, brief people, um, arrange calls, arrange virtual briefings, go, you know, knock on legislators' uh, doors around the time of your story coming out. Um, this takes your time, but it's not a huge resource. Um, and I think people are open to talking. Um, obviously, social media is a key and sort of cheap uh, tool for getting your story out there, tagging people that you want to see the story in your posts and so on. Um, and then the other um, tip that I would say is when your stories are coming out and you're sending them to your network, you're sending it back to people that you maybe worked with on the story. Um, if you're sending it kind of further in the network, I think always asking people for a comment um, gets it read faster than a for info um, or, you know, we have this story out today. And I just used this slide to illustrate that because we had a sort of day two story from our college and investigation because I reached out to a lot of MPs in the UK and European politicians and some campaigners um, and just gathered a lot of quotes from them. And this was just a kind of 400 word piece um, with reactions to the story. So those are my kind of three tips if you're zero budget, zero time, but want to just generate a little bit of extra impact around your stories. So thank you very much. I thought that was extremely useful and practical, actually. I took a, I took a lot of notes, and I know where people are asking if we'll get the slides, and I, I think the answer is yes, as well as the uh, YouTube video that will be up later, but I, for one, will be assigning this to my students straight away. This is a really, really useful, practical discussion that it sounds like even small outlets in different parts of the world will be able to do some of that. Um, good. And I think that we have uh, Dadmika next, as I understand it. Yes. And you're showing slides too. Looking forward. Okay. Thank you, Anya. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Thank you to uh, Anne and Andrea from the IGN for organizing the event. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hope you can see it. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with Tempo, we are a legacy publication. We started as a weekly magazine back in 1971. So we are 50, 52 years old this year. Um, we started our digital transformation, uh, I think, uh, 10 years ago. And now we are uh, growing as a digital uh, publication, we have uh, digital daily newspapers and, a, and a, uh, an online uh, breaking news website. But our flagship publication uh, is still the, the magazine uh, in its print format and also on a digital format. Uh, each year, each week, every week, we publish uh, one big cover story and we have a uh, dedicated investigative team that publish uh, investigative uh, stories. Uh, we try every three or four months. Um, so the, the, the issue on measuring impact is quite, uh, quite a new thing for us. And I'm just going to take uh, you in a journey to understand um, how do we do that at Tempo uh, and uh, maybe it's, it's a bit contextual for those of you who are start thinking of measuring impact and see you know the experience that we have done uh, in this topic and probably some lesson learned at the end. 
Um, so let's start with the with the question of uh, why do we need to measure the impact? On your screen, you can see a, a slide from similar web for, for those of you who are familiar with analytics. This is one of the tools to measure the reach, uh, page views, uh, unique users that you get for a period of time. And you can compare your website with the other websites in your region. Uh, and I think the first thing that come to mind if you thinking of measuring impacts is to see this uh, tools to use this analytics tool. Um, with these tools, you can instantly know how many people read your stories, uh, how many uh, people stay on that site, on that particular story for how long and so on and so forth. Uh, but the, the thing with this kind of metric is it's just the reach of your story. Uh, it's not particularly um, useful if you want to see uh, the changes that happen on the ground after you publish a story. So it's a good start. And we did start with this kind of uh, numbers, but then uh, we decided to uh, to use different and more advanced metrics to, to, to measure the impact. Having said that, I think uh, knowing the rate is not entirely useless because uh, this is an example from our story. We, we had a very uh, uh, high profile murder case uh, in July last year. And we had an exclusive source within the the police. It was a for uh, its two-star police general who killed his own adjutant, his own staff, and uh, there's a lot of rumors surrounding that killing. And we did several uh, reports on that particular case. And each time we publish exclusive finding, we can see the spike in the traffic. We can see also new subscribers uh, paying for that edition. So having that basic numbers, that basic metrics is very important, especially for a legacy media like us, who, you know, maybe some of the editors in our newsroom are still not familiar with, 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 with analytics, with measuring the numbers of audience directly, because we used to have uh, numbers from our uh, circulation, uh, print circulation only. But having seen this is giving an immediate uh, response, uh, giving a sense of uh, uh, feedbacks uh, immediately received by the newsroom. And that's very important to, to, uh, to give encouragement for the, to the newsroom to, to keep digging more uh, in a story. But again, um, reach itself is not enough. So we start looking at different metrics. Uh, the, the, the next step after we uh, uh, realize the limitation of the traffic metric is to see at engagement metric. Engagement metrics meaning that you just, you are not uh, satisfied with only the numbers of page views or numbers of users that are visiting your story, but you're also interested in how interactive you can be or the story uh, can be with the audience. You start measuring um, loyalty. You start measuring uh, interactivity by seeing session per pages or pages per visits and the duration of visits for its, its readers. Uh, and it gives you a sense of a more quality kind of traffic. It's not just traffic, but it's more uh, in-depth and loyal kind of traffic. Um, then we start questioning how about the, the other impact? Um, how do we uh, measure and record um, how a story or uh, trigger change? Um, this is another example. We did a, a long piece, uh, uh, an investigative story back in March 2021, uh, right in the middle of the pandemic, about a uh, questionable uh, procurement for antigen testing for COVID-19. We found that the government has been procuring uh, bogus testing kits that are not compatible with a lot of uh, the, the labs in 
hospitals across the country. Uh, after we did the story, there's a huge outcry from the public, the parliament uh, uh, called uh, the agencies responsible for the procurement, and the story even wins an award from our press council. But those are the impact that we miss from all that digital performance metric. And so the question and suit is how do we then have this uh, this impact also recorded and 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 set it to the wider audience? Because again, if I uh, go back to the initial remarks from Anya in the beginning of our session, we need to uh, keep telling to the public the relevance of our story. We need to help. We need to keep building the trust in in our media, in our stories to the to our audience. So that's the big challenge we face. Um, the, the, the strategy then uh, first start with the definition. We need to, uh, we sit down together, we, we start to define what are the changes that we want to measure. We decided that uh, meaningful response from uh, stakeholders uh, that trigger change on the ground is, uh, is the one that we need to track and to measure and that can be everything from uh, a small letters from our audience saying that they were uh, moved by a story it can be a call from the police uh, or, or from a law enforcement agency saying that they want to hear more about the story and they want to pursue or want to follow up the story or it can be an invitation to uh, to attend a hearing in the parliament uh, because of a story and we follow up on those response. We publish stories on those uh, response uh, on our uh, on our other outlets, on the newspapers, on the, on the online websites, and and help keep the story rolling, keep the story uh, being discussed uh, online. Um, this is one of the example of how we. Uh, implement that strategy. This is a story that we published uh, at the end of last year. And then on general, it's about illegal nickel mining. As you know, in Indonesia, there's a big uh, push to uh, to become the, the center of nickel mining to create batteries for electronic vehicles. But the, a lot of the nickel mining was uh, uh, was on uh, protected forest area, a lot of illegal nickel mining. And the, the mines belong to powerful officials, belong to police generals, belong to ministries and uh, ministers officials, and so on. So a week after we published the story, uh, the police raid some of the illegal mining, and uh, they uh, they uh, promised that to close the loopholes in the in the, in the legal uh, framework for getting licenses for the for the nickel mining. Uh, we did that. Uh, follow up on the story and we keep an eye of the law uh, enforcement after the story uh, was published. This is another big uh, example of, you know, keep uh, following up on a story. Uh, this is an investigative story we did in August last year in 2022 uh, on a big philanthropic uh, organization in Indonesia that we found misusing the public donation. Um, several weeks after that, uh, the, the, the chairman of the organization was arrested and in January he was sentenced three and a half years in jail. And we were the first publication that, uh, that broke the story and kept following the story with, with follow-ups after uh, the big investigative uh, story was first came out. And then we also uh, asked our audience team um, to uh, amplify those uh, follow-up stories. We created uh, discussion on space on Twitter. We have discussions on our telegrams uh, groups because we have different telegram groups for different topics. Uh, in total, we have around uh, 11,000 readers in 10 different telegram groups discussing different topics. And each time we publish a big story and following up the story, we create interactive discussion on those platforms. Uh, the idea is to keep the story alive and keep people uh, following up and get more impacts from those interactions. 
Um, so this is the last slide. Some of the lesson learned from this journey was that we realized that only traffic metrics is not enough. Uh, we need to consider engagement metrics, and then we need to also start defining and tracking uh, other impact. And uh, also it's our responsibility to keep uh, the story alive, amplifying it on our social media platforms. But I have to be honest, we are still a long way to go uh, from Grace examples. Uh, we, uh, we still need a lot of uh, you know, different uh, strategy and measurement tools to be able to assess what is the long-term impact of our stories. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. I think that's ab you know absolutely fascinating, and I think us that your you and Grace have both answered a bunch of the questions that the audience has posed, which we'll delve into more later. But the idea of getting your readers to um, amplify your work, I think, is 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 really very very clever. In fact, yeah, I think we're turning now to Lindsay. Thank you so much, um, and thank you both to Grace and Bayou for your great presentations. I think a, a lot of what I'll talk about today really follows um, nicely from the great examples you all have given. Um, I'm Lindsay. I founded Impact Architects about six years ago, and as mentioned, we do strategy and research with media companies as well as with foundations that support journalism and media. Um, and one big part of the work that we do is around media impact. And we have a platform called the Impact Tracker that I'll kind of come back to at the end of the, the presentation here. Um, but first, I'm just going to talk about how we think about impact, you know, big picture overall, um, how we think about creating a culture of impact inside of an organization, you know, regardless of the size and the resources available. So from you know, one person up to a, a large team and, and with resources have positions like an impact producer. Um, and then again, we'll, we'll get into kind of how you can get around to measuring some of that impact. And again, we've heard some great examples already of, of what that looks like in practice. Um, and then we'll finish by introducing the impact tracker, which is a, a free platform that um, again, can be used by organizations, large or small. Um, I should say before I started my company, I worked at the Center for Investigative Reporting um, and it's a nonprofit investigative news organization based in the US. And so much of the thinking that's gone into the impact work that we do uh, comes from thinking about it in the context of investigative news in particular. So hopefully this will feel familiar to, to many folks who are working in the investigative journalism space. Um, but first, you know, Grace mentioned impact means different things to different people. Um, it's it's a big word. <laughs> we all have ideas of what it means when we hear it. And so for us, it was really important to have a clear definition of impact. And it is not unlike the one that Grace mentioned. Um, we say impact is a change in the status quo resulting from any direct intervention. So it can be text, it can be a documentary film, um, a live event, it can be social media. Uh, that an organization is putting out. It's, it's any kind of content or any sharing of information. And if there's a change, uh, that means we can observe it or we can measure it. And I want to be really clear that when we say impact measurement, we are including those things that why you mentioned like um, unique reach of a story or engagement metrics. But as you said, we're also going to go beyond that and look at that real world change and, and come up with ways for thinking about creating qualitative data sets. So when we say measurement, we mean both quantitative and qualitative impact measurement. And when we think about the type of impact that happens um, in work over the past 10 years, it's, um, it's, kind of shocking, in fact, <laughs> how often it really boils down to four categories of impact that organizations are seeking to, to have or to measure. Um, the first is impact at the level of individuals in the audience. And so that is everything from people learning more information about a, an investigation or a story to maybe changing a behavior or taking some sort of action. And again, some of those things we can see in analytics, we could use something like time on page or scroll depth as a proxy for increased knowledge about an issue. We assume if someone spends a lot of time on page, they've learned something, um, but it doesn't tell us about, did they take an action? Have they done something after the fact? And that might require some additional data gathering or measurement or engagement with our, our audiences. And then in investigative and accountability reporting, especially, 
um, many organizations are focused on institutional impact. And so I think um, both Grace and Wayu gave some great examples of this type of thinking. So who are the people that have access to institutional power that can make change in the short term? Often it's government officials or corporations. And we see that and we kind of know it when we see it. And so we often make notes of that. And I'm just gonna put a pin in that. Um, it's the kind of information we do a follow-up story about or we save somewhere because we are going to put it in an award application that we're gonna send in later. Like it's the stuff we, we know when we see it and we know it's important and we tend to document it somewhere. Um, and then we often hear about kind of network or community impact. This is a little more tricky. It's we see it, we hear about it, you know, we put out a story and we hear that the affected communities are using the content to kind of bolster their own um, claims in some way, or maybe they are going to produce some sort of a lawsuit against a company and the reporting becomes part of that. Like there are all these ways that communities and networks use content to strengthen their work, but it's really hard to measure. We don't always know it right away. It takes a long time. It can be a, a story that happened you know, weeks or months ago, and we find out only, um, you know, a year down the line that in fact, this, this content has been really critically important. So kind of like, what do we do with that information? Um, and then the last category is this, we, we call media amplification, but just this idea of agenda setting. So you put out a story or investigation and suddenly everyone in, in your community or your country, or maybe globally is kind of reporting on that same story. And again, we know it's important. We tend to kind of pay attention to it, but, um, not always in a an organized or structured sort of way. And I know this graphic isn't beautiful, but what's really important to me about it is the fact that these arrows at the bottom go in all different kinds of directions. So we've had some designers that say, we can make it like sleeker and <laughs> make it look a little more seasoned. I'm like, no, the, the point of it is in fact, that it's really messy, that we often assume if we put a story out, if we just reach that one right person, that one change maker, that they'll then take an action. But we know that for so many important stories, especially those that are dealing with folks who um, are marginalized communities, who are excluded from institutions, that change doesn't happen in that way. And so getting information to individuals and to affected communities so that they can make use of that information in different ways is critically important. So I, I just really want to highlight all of those arrows at the bottom as um, this is not a linear model. This is a, a kind of messy model of impact. So when it comes to measurement, when you're thinking about within an organization, you know, what does this require? Um, sounds like a lot of work. This sounds like you're going to need a lot of people. Um, of course, having more people is always great. Who doesn't want more staff capacity? But what you really need is an organizational commitment um, and a prioritization of impact. And so again, this can happen in an organization of one person or of five people or of 25 people or of 150 people. Um, if you have a clear mission and an understanding that the goal of the work, or at least one of the goals of the work, is to, I love how Grace said, it's to spark change, not to go out and campaign for any particular change, but it is to, in fact, spark some sort of change, then it influences everything from story choice to how you're going to write the story, who your assumed audience is, um, all the things you're doing anyway, just your starting point's a little bit different. Um, and you have to prioritize it. It has to fit into your editorial decision making and it has to be a priority. Does this, what's the so what? Is this story going to spark change? Um, and then having a dedicated workflow. And this is that idea that we're not trying to create more work when it comes to measurement, but how can we make sure that it fits into workflows that already exist or that we tweak workflows so that it can become a part of it? Um, and so we suggest having impact tracking be, for most organizations, especially small, being distributed across staff. Um, again, staff can be one person, it can be three people. Um, so that every person who's you know producing a story, who's writing a story, editing a story, is responsible for any impact that comes your way, any of that stuff you're noticing that's happening off the page, things you see in follow-up reporting, that you're documenting it in some way and, and then sharing it with the organization. And for us, Impact Tracker is a platform that helps to facilitate that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But rather than having to have a dedicated staff person, which again, if you can have resources to do that, you absolutely should, that's wonderful. But if not, um, having a distributed workflow is a way to kind of get around the, the burden of, of the work. Um, so there's a question like why impact tracking? Like what, what should we do with it? Um, the first 
for us, and there are like many, many reasons, but when it boils down to the, some of the, the things that we think are most valuable here, one is reputation building. And why you mentioned the word trust, and I, I really wanna underscore that because it's reputation building, not just in the context of maybe funders or um, organizations you could get underwriting from or advertising from, all of which is important, but being able to track and measure your impact and communicate it back to your audience will actually help to build trust among your audience so that they know you're not just doing the story, unveiling you know, the, um, the wrongdoing that happens, but actually sticking with it and making sure that there's some sort of rectification of that problem. Um, I already mentioned editorial strategy. And so having that measurement piece that can feed back into editorial strategy, what worked, what didn't, did we in fact spur any sort of change? What does this tell us about the next time we're gonna do reporting about the environment or climate or something? And, and how do we work that into decision-making? Um, becomes really valuable in terms of a tool. And then finally, it does contribute to institutional support for organizations. So if you're thinking about grant reporting, grant applications, whether it's from private funders, from government, from international funders, um, it, it's often required and it's certainly valuable. So I'm just going to very quickly go through the impact tracker. So given all of this information, we saw a real need um, within organizations to be able to gather what we see as qualitative data. Again, all of these examples of impacts, um, build a culture of impact that could be spread across the organization, and then have some sort of a tool that is customizable and really adaptable and free <laughs> um, that can be that re repository or that database for this type of information. And it's something that's easy to use that folks could get on board with. So the Impact Tracker is a free digital platform. Um, it's built on Google. Uh, and it, that, the goal of it is to help news organizations, funders, and others to understand the impact of journalism by, on the first part, you know, defining what impact is for your organization, then measuring and tracking real world change, and then giving some kind of ways to see trends so that you can really dig into that information to be able to do sense making. Again, the tool doesn't to give you any answers. I would say it kind of gives you better questions to ask about the impact you're having. Um, again, it's free and customizable on Google. Um, it, the dashboard view for this uh, is interactive. Um, it can be accessible to different people in your organization. You can make different views that you could share with other folks, whether it's embedded in your website so that your audience can actually see the impact you're having or if you're sharing it with an institutional funder or something. Um, and when we think about who this is for, for any organizations of any size, um, resources great or small, again, it's free, so it doesn't require any resources. It does potentially require kind of getting up to speed on how to use, um, it's called Google Looker Studio now, it used to be Google, da Google Data Studio. Um, but knowing many of you all are working in organizations that where you have folks who are doing data journalism, it's like, you know, 30 minutes of work to get it set up probably. Um, and organizations that are mission driven and committing to, to spurring or sparking impact with their work. Um, so the process for this that we suggest is first to define impact. So what does it look like for your organization? What are examples that you've seen in the past? And then to develop those indicators for a framework. Again, some that might be quantitative, but probably many that will be qualitative. Um, and then build the tool using that impact framework. And we have resources on our website that are free and you can use to, um, to actually kind of get this set up. Um, there's a simple spreadsheet that will give you some ideas for impact categories. Um, and then you can get to work tracking impact. Um, the way it works is there's an intake form. So when you're an example of impact happens, um, you would go to a URL, you fill out a form, the idea is once you've done it, you know, a couple of times, it should take about 30 seconds to a minute to fill out. So again, trying to bring that burden of work down um, to be as minimal as possible. And then it goes into the database and then you have it in this visualization in the dashboard. Uh, so these resources will be shared after the webinar, but there are links to, um, to all of these resources. And we also have office hours on Tuesdays with my colleague, Rosemary Jo Moore, who is, um, 
wonderfully taking all of this work on and is working with news organizations across the globe right now to get people set up on the impact tracker. And so please do uh, set up time to, to meet with her if this is something that you're interested in. Um, and you can reach out to this email address if you have any additional questions. Um, and we would be very excited to hear how folks are using this tool also and, and what we could do, what kinds of resources we can build around it to continue to make it more useful. That was fantastic, Lindsay. And there's um, so many good questions. I guess I just wanted to make a, a couple of thoughts. One is um, the question came up. Sorry, there's construction going on in my roof. I hope this isn't too terrible. Maybe I'll move my, my laptop. The question came up about, about how do you know if it will work and how do you, um, you know, make, who, who do you target? And I just want to say there's so much interesting literature on the subject. And I put in the chat a sort of seminal piece by uh, Rick Stapenhurst about media fighting corruption and when does that work and, and when doesn't it? And I think in all of these cases, you know, when we look over the last couple hundred years of journalism and advocacy impact, there obviously has to be an entity which is willing to change and is able to change. So I think that's why we often see more success on the smaller things, such as getting somebody to resign from their job or getting somebody out of jail or correcting one or two injustices. I think we have a whole lot of examples where the problem is almost too big. And so it's hard to see that kind of immediate impact. You know, one example is campaign finance, right? We know in the US that we need to change that system, but that's such a huge lift that it can be very, very hard to do. Or if you're covering a very powerful, you know, state-owned oil company or Exxon, it can it can be much harder to get a short-term impact. So I think I think knowing who you're targeting um, is really key. And I, I thought, yeah, great. Grace's point about presenting the information so that it's accessible. You know, I'm at a university and we love to write 150 page papers, but we've discovered that really has no impact on anybody because nowadays nobody can read them. So I thought this packaging, I think journalists are so good at that. Um, the other point I, I just wanted to think about was this video question that came up in the chat is super interesting. And I teach a course on media and social change with a couple of people from Human Rights Watch. And they were telling me yesterday that now the average time of looking at a video in the US is about a second and a half. So people actually have less of an attention span than goldfish who have a nine second attention span. I don't know if others wanted to respond to the question of video or if you perhaps wanted to comment just as I did on each other's work, but uh, this was extreme, extremely interesting. I'd love to hear you respond to each other or to the questions in the chat. Yeah, I yeah. I responded to oh sorry. Go ahead, Greg. Well, I responded to the video question in the chat because this is something we're doing a lot more of at the bureau. Um and we um have a, a new kind of uh, video producer on board and she is Gen Z and knows all about how to navigate TikTok, um, whereas other people do not. Um and I think this is really helpful. I don't I mean, I'm not a, an expert in this. I don't think there's a magic formula. I think, you know, we spent money and time and resources on making the video that accompanied our collagen story. Um, and then we also had a video come out and that was our best performing video on Instagram for, a, for about a week. And then we had another video done very kind of lo-fi, low production, um, another impact producer explaining um, about private investigators um, kind of tagging uh, cars and this, and that just outperformed everything. Um, and that was a really simple kind of vertical video. She was just filming herself. So I think don't underestimate you the reporter like just telling people what your story is into the camera um that's compelling and i think if you are you know hitting people with a grabby opening question like did you know how hacking really works or something like that then that piques people's interest and hopefully they watch it for longer than 1.5 or nine seconds. Um, but it, I think you've really got to be meeting people where they are um, with um, how you're communicating and 
not assuming that people are going to want to watch make it interesting give them information um explain the story but don't be thinking oh i need to get in that detail about this um uh piece of deforestation in this small state when actually you want to just be presenting the bigger picture so yeah that's what i'd say um i know that emily's going to moderate the questions which is just as well given that i have construction but i just want to give the panelists a chance to respond to each other before we open the floor and turn it over to emily any thoughts lindsay or why you on what you've been hearing from each other and from grace yeah i will definitely use impact tracker after this thank you let's see and uh, and on the questions of you know uh anya's point when you know you mentioned long-term changes like campaign finance or you know big uh corporation uh, that also relate to grace point on you know how measuring impact can influence your editorial strategy i think as a newsroom we don't put many thoughts on you know uh on 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 strategy uh putting editorial strategy based on what kind of impacts we want to see in the lower term i think that's really really useful yeah just one thing that i've um wanted to maybe reflect on that i really appreciate from both grace and why you is the the thinking about how to creatively approach like the um the content creation the reporting around impact and how to define kind of where the line is between what the role of journalists are and what the role of different community organizers or others in the space might be um and you know grace you you talked about some of the systems mapping that you do where you bring different stakeholders together and again knowing that's not possible for every story or every investigation or every project but just a really interesting kind of model for for organizations to think about that um when you're doing reporting you're often engaging with and interviewing all of those different stakeholders anyway so the idea of like bringing them together and creating a systems map just feels like such a, a useful way to organize all of that information to really get a sense for where change might happen and we, all, we often say like where's the potential for change um, and I think there were maybe some questions that kind of get at that too. But um, and we talk about potential for change in the short term versus the long term. So you know you might be able to raise awareness really quickly about an issue, but know that that structural systemic change is going to take who knows, you know, a year, three years, fifty years. <laughs> like, um, but but having different kind of goalposts, I think, is is really valuable. So thanks for sharing that approach with everybody. Yeah, and before we come into the questions, I just want to say that Lindsay and I spent a good chunk of the pandemic writing a paper together, which as soon as we finish rewriting it will get published this summer. And one of the exciting things we did was we took all the work that Lindsay had been doing, and then we added a few more dimensions, and we created an impact matrix with 40 kinds or something of, of impact. Maybe that was too many kinds, but one thing I did want to highlight is the actual effect on journalists of, of doing investigative reporting and the effect on their organizations. So one of the things we found, for example, was that, you know, early career journalists who team up and do big investigations, that often really helps their knowledge about the subject, their authority and standing to write more about it, and their um, prominence in the profession, where they get invited to more conferences and they spread their ideas. So writing a story about tax avoidance can change society and it can push laws, but it can also really change how the journalists do their work and what happens to those individual journalists and how their newsroom changes. So we didn't get into that too much today, but I think, and I also think that, um, you know, having been around this topic for decades and worked on financial uh, foundation boards, OSF, that knowing how to do this is also incredibly helpful because it means you can fundraise. It means you can build your organization. You know, when we first started writing about impact 15 years ago, a lot of journalists said, oh, this isn't our job. We don't want to do this. But in fact, it turned out knowing how to do it made them more effective. So I think that's another reason for sort of you know, losing your fear and kind of embracing some of the ideas that, that we're hearing about on this Zoom. And the other thing to highlight is none of these Zooms are turning journalists into like clickbait or making them more superficial. They're really deepening and enriching their, their work. You know, in my book, Global Muckraking, we talk about how journalists have been trying to make change for hundreds of years. You know, this is not a, a new idea. Um, so anyway, I think I'll stop here and I'll let Emily take over on the questions, but thanks, thanks for letting me put in my observations about this very, very interesting panel.
Thanks, Anya. Thanks, everyone. It is a really interesting topic that you kind of all approach in different ways, which is really interesting. Um, the first question from the audience is for Grace. Obviously, you've discussed um, how you kind of approach impact from the beginning of the story. Um, but there was a question in the chat. Does it necessarily follow that an investigative story wasn't worth investing time and resources in if it didn't produce the desired impact? And at what stage can one draw that conclusion? Um, and also a kind of a question in the question, if if it doesn't have that impact, do you drop the story? Do you kind of try and rearrange how you're approaching it? Um, what What's your kind of view on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think while I've said we have like a very broad church and broad definition around, you know, what we consider to be impact from a story, um, we aren't prescript what well, we try not to be prescriptive about what the impact we want to see being and we keep it in quite kind of broad goals I would say um because you know we are not campaigners we are not um we are not activists and so we're never going to say we want this person to resign you know like that's just unacceptable you know in in journalism so we will be kind of going through, you know, who we want to get the story in front of. But even just the kind of the fact that a politician cites our story in a speech, you know, we would capture that and we would see that as a success because the law change might be happening in two or three years time, but we're still going to be recording and measuring the fact that somebody cited our investigation and our work. Um, and so I think um, it's quite rare that we would be sort of ditching something halfway if we were thinking this isn't going to be impactful at all. And I think another crucial point is that you can't claim all the impact for all the changes. You know, you it's never just one story. And even if it feels like it is one story, you know, there's a whole other network of people that we've talked about um, who, you know, are, are bringing about such change. And I think, um, you know, that's something we have to be careful around too, is to sort of not, you know, there's correlation, but not necessarily causation um, with, with impact. And so we don't want to overstate, you know, we did this kind of thing. So we are, you know, we are recording what we're doing. We're recording the small things, the citations, oh, this person um, put something in a newsletter. Sorry, there's a massive hailstorm suddenly. Um, and yeah, so we find, um, uh, yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't scrap something. I, has, has that answered the question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and kind of just a follow up about what you said about not being um, not campaigning on behalf of people. Obviously, it's interesting that you go to lawyers and NGOs um, before you do a story. Um, and how do you kind of ensure that that doesn't influence the direction of your reporting too much in terms of not making it independent um, in that sense? Yeah, well, I think we just want to gather as much information as possible, you know, and our investigative journalists are very good at knowing, you know, whatever source or if somebody's input has a particular agenda or a particular background. And I think that's all um, part of it. I think it's just useful to have that kind of wealth of information of like, pressure points and even kind of calendar pressure points, you know, working in the environment team, the, the COPs, COP26, COP27 have been pretty important calendar points for us in terms of we want a story out before then, um, knowing that they'll be talking about deforestation, for example. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know why you, I see you nodding to that. I think, um, yeah, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's just a regular, um, you know, uh, process of, of preparing a story when you uh, identifying uh, stakeholders or people or parties who can uh, have a stake on the on the issue and can have a comment and, 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 and more importantly can you know give us the reporter uh, uh, an insight of you know the extent of wrongdoings or the 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 particular regulation or 
convention or anything that is being broken by a certain action. So it's just part of the regular um, outlining of a story. But at the same time, when you see this as part of your impact assessment or impact measurement, you also, you know, somehow put them, you know, as part of your strategy of you know getting the the the, the right impact once the story out. Yeah, if I could just jump in real quick, one thing I would I would just I agree with everything you both said and might add to it. There was a question too about what about like if change is negative. So if there's no change or if there's a change that isn't positive. And you know, I think that's part of why we say like a change in the status quo. There isn't a positive or or negative. It's we're just trying to see what happens afterwards and then think about what do we learn about our approach and how does that feed back into editorial strategy going forward. So thinking about this as like an ongoing practice that's just part of workflow, um, I think is really valuable. And the same way you might have like an analytics report about a big project that you put a lot of resources on into, you know, how do we think about what is the impact piece of that look like? And, and the timelines look different. Sometimes it might be one month after publication. Often you're going to come back to this like a year later and say, what did the impact look like over the long term? And that gets to another you know, question about what's the attribution versus contribution. If you're looking at change over time as it happens, you get a much more holistic view of what the role of your, your reporting was in that change, what different community members maybe did with reporting, but they took a lot of action and had a lot of agency and actually putting pressure on government officials, for example, to then take some sort of action versus thinking like, we shine a light on the project and then the politicians responded. Often it, it, it is actually agents on the ground that are using your content in some way. So I think, you know, paying attention to it over the long term, often so the stories we maybe think, oh, it wasn't that successful. Actually, it, it might be, but it takes a lot more time for the change to happen. Um, so just my two cents. Thank you. Um, so we also have a question for why. Um, obviously, um, the Bureau have their own investigative um, impact editor, sorry. Um, and Somebody's asked whether at Tempo you have an impact editor or producer on staff um, who monitors impact and do you use any particular software to do so? No, not yet. We are, are thinking about it. Um, um, but as uh, Lindsay mentioned in, in one of our slides, we, we try to uh, have a, a uh, a, a certain workflow, uh, a dedicated workflow, but not necessarily a dedicated person attached to that, uh, that responsibility. So we ask our audience development team to keep track of any changes, any response of the, from a story, uh, particularly from a follow-up uh, pieces that we usually publish after a big investigative story uh, was out. So, uh, uh, but, Obviously, moving forward, we uh, we are planning to have a dedicated person on impact, and I think there's there's a lot of uh, you know tools uh, that can be uh, used. Uh, after Lindsay present the impact tracker, I'm, I'm thinking of using it, uh, but right now we are just using a simple uh, spreadsheet just to to see uh, and to record uh, changes that happen after a story out. Thank you. you have your spreadsheet. You're already like sixty percent of the way there, Claudia. All you need is just you we hook up the form, hook up the the uh, visualization, and you're all set. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then we have a question for Lindsay. Um, so, say if a small or medium investigative journalism organization decided to hire an impact editor. Um, what do you think are the key aspects to take into account when hiring? Um, what kind of experience does someone need to have? Um, and a sub question within that as well. Um, if you don't have an impact editor, how do you motivate staff to report on impact um, and look into the effect that stories having? 
Yeah, I'll maybe work backwards because I, I would love to know what Grace would say for the hiring on an impact editor or impact producer. Um, but from how do you incentivize staff? We actually, there's a resource in the workspace that has like some five best practices. But uh, one of them is really just, again, this cultural piece, like having it be part of the workflow, part of the work expectations, it being something that everyone from the editor in chief or executive director is on board with down to the reporters and it just being an expectation of part of the job I think is really important um, and the then beyond that some of the strategies you can get into become really tactical um, so is it that you have you know an every Monday editorial meeting and once a month you you block 10 minutes and you actually have people enter impact during the meeting until it becomes a practice is it that you invite everyone to a 10 minute a week calendar invite that is actually like a a virtual meeting where everybody spends 10 minutes entering their impact. Um, there's actually a Slack integration now for the impact tracker. So there is a way to have an integration with a Slack channel. And I know lots of organizations use Slack and have like an impact channel already where they might use it as kind of a celebration space to share exciting stuff that's happening. So that's possible. It requires a little work on the back end to kind of clean up the entries. Um, but again, if you have a person who can do it. There's some ways there. So just getting creative to, again, see what's a workflow that's going to work for your organization that makes it really easy for people. And that especially as you're getting going with the tracking and measurement, um, encourages people and maybe pushes them to fill out the form a few times with examples because it really is it's one of those once you get over the hump of doing it let's say like five times then you're like oh this is really easy it's quick it doesn't take much time and and you have that kind of muscle developed um so in terms of some of like the strategies and tactics that's how to go around it um and again i'd love to hear what grace would say one thing i will say about an impact producer or editor though it's like they it's great if they have a background in journalism or reporting but it doesn't i don't think it necessarily has to be a journalist. And I think there are a lot of organizations that see those roles as being roles that kind of bridge um, community organizing or have worked in policy spaces and often have a background in journalism or reporting in some way, because it, it really is like a bridge role. And so, you know, thinking kind of broadly about the skills that somebody might have would, would be my, my only advice there. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. If, if there's time to come in and just um, in terms of uh, the kind of communicating internally, we we do as the Bureau, just for what Lindsay said in our Monday morning editorial meeting, we do have 10 minutes dedicated to talking about impact um, in that meeting. And we have, you know, in our kind of common communication channels, people are always kind of putting in bits of impact and either the person responsible in that team or the impact editor is just gathering all of that and we're putting things into Google Docs. Um, and we also have our weekly CEO email to the whole organization and the board. Um, and we always like to highlight nice pieces of impact in there. Um, I would also agree with what Lindsay said about people's backgrounds. If you're looking to hire impact producers um, or an impact editor, um, what we've seen is... Um, I have a sort of television production background, but also I worked in EU politics for several years. Um, and so I think there's that kind of combination of the production and the kind of advocacy um, side of things. Um, another of our impact producers, she's worked in Westminster um, in the UK Parliament, and she's really specialized in that. And actually what we're seeing is that she's helping other teams rather than the team she was hired for. And that's kind of now organizational knowledge and an organizational resource. Um, and then another of our impact producers has um, more of an um, advertising background and is really good in terms of uh, communicating and production and kind of creative direction um, and has produced some amazing materials. Um, so we kind of, yeah, I think um, you can be hiring people quite creatively, really. And I think the trend we're now seeing in the Bureau is that every impact producer not only has their team and is working on environment or global health, but has their kind of specialism now within impact on what we're generating. 
Um, I thought this was really helpful. And I just want to say that I'm sure the GIJN website probably has a whole lot of resources on measuring impact. And if they don't, I would be more than happy to provide them because I've obviously read hundreds of reports and academic papers on this. We're also seeing now at Columbia, our political scientists and our economic economists are looking at this topic. So one of our PhD students has been looking at investigative reporting in Tanzania and the effect it's having on small communities. So I think this is an area where we're getting more and more information. And of course, all of your websites, you know, I took a look at Grace's impact page uh, while you were speaking. Lindsay's given us a super useful tracker um, Marshall, you know, Marshall Project, ProPublica, I mean, everybody now explains sort of how they think about impact. So I think for everyone in the audience who wants to get started, there, there's actually a lot out there. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting a link from GIJN for the slide and for the slides and the talks. And I just really want to thank our panelists, Wahyu and Lindsay and Grace and also GIJN, Emily and Anne, who we worked, you know, very, very hard to put this together. Um, and I think it's really paid off. So thanks all. I'll definitely be using this in my class next week, in fact. So thanks everybody. And I hope you all have a good weekend and maybe a little time off. Thanks for the great questions too.